I remember seeing the dictator, the great dictator, with Charlie Chaplin, and he had everybody applauding, and then suddenly everybody stopped. I'm glad it wasn't quite like that. I want you to know that this person whom you're listening to right now is not in himself important. I would like to give you a little bit of my history because it's a very interesting history in spite of my own unimportance. I was born in Romania and I was born there in 1926, so I don't have to hide my age. And uh, I lived there for 13 years. I went to school in Switzerland and learned French. I, learned, I went to school in England. So I grew up learning and speaking French, German, uh, Romanian, and uh, English. And uh, later on I learned other languages. But the thing that I learned was always something I didn't want. I didn't feel any particular pleasure in being able to talk languages. I didn't feel any pleasure going anywhere. I grew up in the pre-war years, as I think we still call them. In the years when Hitler's troops were marching boldly and uh, malevolently across Europe, and I felt there's just got to be a better way of living. And I was trying to find a truth that would help all of humanity. From childhood, I was seeking this truth. I remember, first of all, I wanted to be an astronomer. And I thought, well, the thing that inspires me about the stars is their great vastness, their beauty, and yet I can't reach out and touch them. What, is there, what does it matter to me if there are a billion galaxies or a hundred billion galaxies in the universe? It just didn't seem to matter. And I was becoming more and more desperate as to the true meaning of life as Neil Donald Walsh was talking to you about. I was desperately concerned about the triviality of life that I saw lived around me. And I remember I turned from astronomy and science thinking that mere mental knowledge won't give it to me, but maybe my heart will. And so I sought inspiration. And I thought it through the arts, through poetry, through music. And I had a certain gift for these things, and it came naturally to me. But I also used to practice the piano for many hours a day, and it meant a lot to me, and yet not enough. Not enough. There was always something lacking. And I had been brought up I hate to say it to those of you who, have, who are Episcopalians, because to me, I have to admit, it was a dead religion. I got absolutely nothing out of it. And I wanted something more real than formal rituals and formal rites. And I didn't know where to find these things. And I tried everywhere except God which was really the only place you can, you, you can ever find him. And I tried writing. I wanted to be a, a novelist and a writer and a poet. And I did everything that I could up within the, the very limited range of my own talent. I wanted to be a playwright until it occurred to me that what I really wanted to do was somehow share truth with people. And I did not know what that truth was. And I thought, how can I even dare to write about a truth 
that I myself don't know. Writing should be a means of helping us to grow. But this was making too large a leap. I had no idea what truth was. And yet I looked through history and I did see that there were people in history who had made great changes in the world and that those changes had brought people a comfort, a joy, and a peace that was meaningful. And in every single case, those people were Buddha, Jesus Christ, spiritual leaders. And I thought, then what is this with God that makes him so important that only he has given the answers to what life is all about? And I remember I had been in South Charleston, South Carolina, studying stagecraft. And I remember going out one night into the night and I said, well, everything points to the fact that, that there has to be a God. You must exist. But if there is a God, what must he be? And I thought deeply about this. And I thought that God has to be consciousness. It isn't enough that he be a figure, that's ridiculous. That he be a judge or a policeman or something, ridiculous. But that question that enabled me to ask the question, is there a God? And if so, what is that God? That consciousness that enabled me to ask that question meant that God has to be that. He has to be consciousness itself. And he began thinking. I remember this long walk I took out into the countryside at night. And I thought, if God exists, what must he be? And I came to that conclusion. He must be consciousness. Then my consciousness must be a part of his consciousness. And if that's the, so, the case, then my job in life is to come closer to that consciousness. And I realized that there were times in my life when I was less aware, other times when I was more aware. Times when I got drunk, I was not really very aware. Times when I was very sensitive to things I became very much more aware. And I decided that my job in life, if this is the truth, can only be one. I must seek God. And I decided then and there to give my life to searching for him. I had no idea that anybody had ever tried this before. I had no idea that there were such things as saints in this world. I had no idea that God can not only be sought, but found. I had no idea of any truth, really. And yet, I wanted desperately, not just for myself, but for many other people. I saw all these people as Neil Donald Ross was talking about, the trivia in this world, the emptiness of it. I saw that just cannot be the answer. There has to be something much more real. And I thought, when I came to this conclusion that God has to be consciousness, then I came to the second conclusion that my consciousness must be part of his consciousness. And that if that is so, then my duty in life must be to seek closer unity with that consciousness. And I remember coming home after that long walk and seeing my roommates in the kitchen all drinking coffee and laughing. And they were laughing about such trivial things. 
They go, what do I need with these yapping puppies? <laughs> there must be something more. And I decided then and there. I was 21 at the time. And I decided I had to give my life to this search. And if, it's, if God cannot be found, all right, he cannot be found. But I still have to do my best to find him. And I heard, I talked about some of these things to somebody in a, in a cafe in Charleston. And he was talking about the Bhagavad Gita. And I don't know if you believe in reincarnation, but I do. And I have to say that that dream rang a deep bell in my heart. Okay. Strange as that name sounded, it rang a bell and I remembered it. Well, anyway, not very long afterwards, I thought, first of all, I had thought, well, I've sought through science, I've sought through, sought through the arts, I've sought through literature, I've sought through this, 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 and this. Maybe one final excuse I can find so that I don't have to seek God. And that excuse may be that I need to be more in tune with nature. I'm living too sophisticated in Eng uh, a city life. And I decided to go out into the countryside and live among so-called simple, rustic people. I found them a lot less simple, less rustic, and less anything than anybody I'd met. And I just realized finally that I had to go to, I had to go to some place where I could live very cheaply. I thought Brazil came to mind because it would be easy to live in Brazil. I used to smoke, but I thought, well, if I'm a, if I'm a, a smoker, how could I possibly be a, her be a hermit? Where would I buy my cigarettes from? <laughs> so I had to give that up. Well, it wasn't easy. <laughs> Giving things up was not easy. I tell you, every lunchtime with my lunch coffee, I would think, gee, smoking was awfully nice, and I had my coffee at lunch, and I'd go back to it. I was like Mark Twain, who said that smoking is the easiest habit in the world to give up. I've done it a thousand times. <laughs> Well, I did it a thousand times. But each time I did so, and this is a point I would like all of you to remember, each time I did so, I never told myself I have failed. I always said, I haven't yet succeeded. And so each time I failed was an affirmation of potential success. Don't you see how important that is? Every time you fail in life to live up to an ideal, never tell yourself I've failed. Tell yourself I haven't yet succeeded, but I'm going to keep trying and keep trying. Well, after a year, I remember telling one of my roommates, I lived with four men. I remember telling him, well, tomorrow I'm quitting cigarettes. Ah, oh, I've heard that one before. Well, I meant it. The next day, I left every desire for cigarettes. I never had another desire in my life. And this, in, in this way, gradually, I came closer. I wanted to give up. Uh, well, I wasn't drinking, wasn't an addiction. Smoking was. But I thought, I remember going into a bar in New York, and it was very hot, and it was May or June, and I was thinking that a beer would really taste good now. So I went in and I had a beer. I had two beers, in fact. <laughs> and I suddenly realized that I hadn't lost my mental clarity, but I had to admit my mental clarity had diminished. And I thought that anything that makes me less aware has to be wrong. And so I gave it up. I didn't know that there were 
people who had ever sought God. I didn't know that saints existed. My mother was a devout Episcopalian. She used to say to me, speak to me about the lives of saints. And I would say, Mother, come off it. It just seemed like an absurdity to me. But when I got this in intense desire, I realized it was the only thing I could do. And I wouldn't tell her, I wouldn't tell anybody. This was something too deep and too private to talk about with anyone. But I remember my dad was sent to Cairo, Egypt. He was an oil geologist. He'd been sent there by Ezo to look for oil. And uh, I put my mother on the ship. Well, I had found in her, her library a book called The Short World Bible. And it showed little short excerpts from the different great scriptures of the world. And I read the scriptures of Hinduism. I thought, this is for me. This doesn't speak about a person. This doesn't speak about particular time or religion or beliefs. It speaks about eternity. It speaks about a truth that is eternal. It speaks about a reality that is infinite, that isn't tied down to one human being, that speaks about God as everywhere. And I thought, this I can accept. Anyway, the day that I put my mother, mind you, in the Indian scriptures it says that when the heart is, when the devotee is ready, God himself responds and sends you a guru. I didn't want a guru. I didn't know what a guru was. All the men I'd ever met seemed too dumb to listen to. <laughs> I can't attribute that to egotism, but maybe it was. It just didn't seem that they said anything that made sense. And when I read that, when I, I, I read that, I went into this bookstore after leaving my mother on the ship. I went into this bookstore. It was called Doubleday Duran at the time. And there it talked about, it showed the Bhagavad Gita. Somebody had told me about the Bhagavad Gita. And I thought, oh, this is interesting. Let me get it. And I saw a book. Now this you'll find. Some of you who know the path that I have followed will call me ridiculous at this point. Well, I was ridiculous. Because I read, I saw autobiography of a yogi. There was something deeply compelling about that face. As if it was an old friend. And it was dedicated, I opened it up, it was dedicated to Luther Burbank, an American saint. I said, oh, that's ridiculous. How could any American be a saint? <laughs> I refused to read anything further. And I read the autobiography, I read the Bhagavad Gita. It's a short book, deep and wonderful. And I, I was trying to get a job on a ship because I figured that on a ship I wouldn't be able to spend my money if I could save money quickly. Then I could go to Brazil and live in a forest and spend my life seeking God. And if I found a little bit of peace even, then I would find something worthwhile. And if I didn't find him, the world was well off without me. But if I could find him, maybe I could help others to find him also. And so it was that I, I uh, was coming into town the next, a few days later after reading the Bhagavad Gita. And I said, that autobiography of Yogi has a very attractive feeling to it. I said, oh, too many books. I'm too intellectual. I've spent my money on books. Stop it. So I decided the subway was on the other side of the street. I was walking toward that subway. 
And my plan was to take that subway down to Bowling Green to see if a ship would come in that I could berth on. And before crossing the street, I really, I felt the power turning me left and blowing me toward Fifth Avenue. And I said, there's got to be something in a book that can cause me to make a decision so completely contrary to my own will. And I went into this bookstore. I bought that book. And when I was there, a friend of mine from Sky High School, we graduated together four, five years ago. And uh, he was talking to me excitedly about all the money he was going to get in advertising. He was going to earn a, enough money to buy a beautiful house in Scarsdale where I lived. And he was going to have a beautiful family and all these things. The more he talked, the more I blushed this book to my heart. I thought, that life is death to me. Well, I bought that book and it was absolutely a change in my life. From the very first page, I think what won me more than the wonderful stories he told and so on, I'd been against miracles, I thought they were nonsense. He told miracles, but I just put them on a shelf. I couldn't believe them, I couldn't disbelieve them. What made me believe in him was his attitude toward life. Everything was a beautiful attitude of expansiveness, of acceptance, of love for everybody. It was the most thrilling human being I had ever encountered in the pages of a book. And I decided I would take the next bus across the country. He lived in Los Angeles. I was in New York. I took the next bus across the country. And I remember thinking that I want two things. I want to meet my guru. I never thought about needing a guru. But this was a man of whom I could absolutely depend. I want to reach, I want to know him because I know he can teach me how to find God. I went to him also with the desire that if what I find is what I want, then I want to share it with everybody because I want the whole world to know how wonderful this truth is, that we've all come from God and that our job in life is to know God and to see God in one another and to live a godly life. And when I met him, the first words I said to him were, I want to be your disciple. I was not so easy to see him. They told me that his appointments were fully, were fully booked for two and a half months. But with God's grace, he did allow me to see me see him. He said, I'm not seeing you because you've come such a distance. A lady came all the way from Sweden two weeks ago, and I wouldn't see her because Divine Mother didn't tell me to. But Divine Mother told me to see you. And he accepted me then and there. And I have been his disciple now for nearly 62 years. And I can say it has been the most wonderful thing in my life. Now I wanted this evening to talk about him. To talk about a person is not enough when you talk about a master. The purpose of life is to unite your soul with God. God created this whole universe out of his consciousness. This is how this whole universe was created. That was my inspiration down in Charleston. But I knew that the goal of life has to be union with that consciousness. And when you realize that, then you realize God dreamed this entire universe 
you sitting there listening to me, me sitting here talking to you, all that noise from over there, and I suppose Hollywood Bowl, whatever it is. Um, all these things are a part of his great dream. And I know that I knew that this has to be what I have to look for. Not only that, but I discovered that my ego is non-existent. Your ego is non-existent. You as people don't exist. You are manifestations of his dream. He is dreaming you and me. And this is the most wonderful discovery and has brought me so much happiness and so much bliss, I have to add, that I can hardly stand that bliss sometime. This is the goal of life to know that your nature is bliss and everything that you are looking at. I remember a few months ago I was in a hotel room in, uh, um, what are we going to know, in, in Firenze, in, in Switzerland. I move around so much it's hard to remember where I am. I had to remind myself that today I would be speaking English. <laughs> And uh, I realized that everybody that I ever meet and see, they all want that bliss. It's such a wonderful thing to think. Why should we love everybody? Because they're a part of that bliss. They're all looking for that same bliss, and they're all a part of it. And that bliss that I am looking for, they too are looking for them. How could you not love somebody whose very goal in life is bliss? I tell you, I was looking for a piece of paper on which to write this great inspiration, and I couldn't find it in any note in my, news, in my suitcase, and I couldn't find it in any hotel note paper. Finally, I got a little round doily, paper doily that was under a glass, and I wrote this thought down there. But I think it's one of the most important thoughts I've ever had in my life. The reason for loving everybody is everybody is seeking the same bliss you are. And what a wonderful thing it is to see the, the worst mafioso. He just doesn't know what he wants in life, that's all. He's really a child of God who wants that same God you may want. But all of us basically will never find what we're looking for until we find that bliss of our own nature. Well, when I met Yogananda, I remember one time, I was sitting with him at his feet and he was editing his bio commentaries on the Bhagavad Gita. And I, <clears throat> I was just thinking, what a blessing it is to be his disciple. What a blessing it is to be able to sit at his feet and receive, receive this deep truth that he teaches. And I remember when he, he stood up, he asked me to help him stand. And he looked at me just very close in the eyes like this. And he said, just a bulge of the ocean. He never thought, I am I. When I looked into his eyes, I never saw ego there. I saw the consciousness of God manifesting through that ego. I never saw likes or dislikes. I never saw him unkind. I never saw him um, judgmental. I saw in him that absolute perfection that I'd always dreamed of in human beings. He was so dear. He was so, well, what can I say? Dear says it all. He was dear to my soul and dear to my ego. And I have decided to stay here in Los Angeles and teach that teaching for a while. I used to teach here. I used to teach in Hollywood Church, the SRF Hollywood Church. I was with SRF for 14 years. I got flung out on my ear. I don't blame them. 
I had to be myself. I could not follow an organization. I could not follow what other people told me. I followed him completely because what he said was completely what I accepted. I did not follow them because they didn't. And also, I couldn't follow them because they told me things to do that were not according to my own feeling of what is right and wrong. And they were not what he himself had told me to do. He had told me to spread his message. He had told me, I remember there was one time when another disciple and I were standing side by side and Herbert Freed, that name disciple, he was being sent off to Phoenix to um, be the minister there. And then Master paused a moment and he said, you have a great work to do. And I looked at Herbert with a sort of felicitation and he said, it's you I'm talking to, Walter. He used to call me Walter only because my last name is Walters, I suppose. But anyway, it's stuck. <laughs> and uh, it stuck. It was a deep thing with me that what he told me, anything he told me, your life is writing, writing, lecturing, editing. I said, but sir, haven't you yourself written all the books that could possibly be written. And he looked quite shocked. And he said that, don't say that. Much more is needed. And I understood that our job as the disciples is not to repeat like robots what he said. It's to teach his teachings in new and creative ways that other people can accept in their ways. So I have written something like 140 books, but all of them have been with the purpose of making people in different walks and interests in life aware of how his teachings are the answer to what they are seeking. And, uh, well, I did have my differences. I have to admit it. I have to feel that I have to say that I don't think they were always doing his will. I want to remain here partly because I want people to understand how deeply loving he was. He wasn't the fierce disciplinarian that many people think. And I also want the truth. Diamata said to me one time, I called all the monks and nuns together and told them, I've heard that some of you have been told that Kriyananda was dismissed. He was not dismissed, he was re-resigned. And I said, I cannot say that because you know it's not, because it isn't true, and you know it isn't true. And she paused a frustrated moment, and then she said, well, you should have resigned. <laughs> and I understood then what she meant. They had done their best at that meeting in New York when they threw me out on my ear, I might just as well say it. I had done my best to do his will and I had never tried to go against his will. But I was loyal to him as my guru, my guru, not to them as my guru. He was my guru not they. And so it was that many times they made statements and I, they were conveniently, convenient organizationally, they were not convenient spiritually. I had to tell the truth. And so it was that, yes, there were many things that went on that this distressed me. But I have tried my best to teach the truth as he taught it, and as I have to add, as I understood it. Because I can only understand, I can only teach what I understand. 
And if I am wrong, and am shown to be wrong, I'm happy to be told that I'm wrong, because my dedication is to truth above all. But I have found that in his teachings, in the love that he gave, in everything that I ever received from him, I have found an amazing understanding of life. You know, there's one thing that I wanted to introduce tonight, and it's very interesting, because Yogananda frequently said that he was William the Conqueror. This I found impossible to understand. I had been brought up in the English system. In the English system, William the Conqueror is one of the great villains of history. And here I found he was my own guru. <laughs> I had to do a lot of thinking and a lot of research. And finally I gave Catherine Gairavi the job of researching his life. And it had come to me during my studies with him that I was his son, Henry, and that too had come to me. And I thought, Catherine, please spend some years now dead researching his life and finding out the parallels between William and Yogananda, between Henry and Priyananda. Find out if they exist. Find out what you can. Because it seemed to me that if Master had said that he was William the Conqueror, he must have said so for a reason. And that reason had to be an important reason for his mission. And so that book, which will come out very soon, in, um, in fact, it should have come out today, but it will come out tomorrow. So a little bit late, but you can order pre-copies. You can order 100 copies up to now. But I would say that it's an extremely well-written book and full of fascinating insights into truth and into um, spiritual truth. You know, Master, when he said, you have a great work to do, he said it to me many times, always in private, except for that one first time because he wanted my way. He understood that I would have to take it in a different direction. But I remember him one time saying to me, apart from St. Lynn, every man has disappointed me, and you mustn't disappoint me. And he said it with so much strength that I vowed that I would do my best. Why did he say that? He had men who did not disappoint him spiritually. But the nature of men is different from the nature of women in this one respect, that man is outwardly giving, woman is inwardly receiving. Man organizes, women accept and understand. But the nature of man is to create new things, much more so than women. And he had not found anyone to take his mission and make something new of it make something that would change the world. My duty in life, given to me by him, has been exactly that. So thank you for coming and listening to me. It's been a joy.